How do we have better conversations with our patients? We start with bad conversations and learn how to avoid them. Let's find out how. Hey, this is Brad Block, host of The Physician's Guide to Doctoring. This is a personal and professional development podcast for physicians where we have experts on the show that try to teach us everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. We talk a lot about side gigs on this show. So if your side gig or even your main gig is a medical technology product that you want to pitch, or you're even in the early stages of product development, you could benefit from consulting with Charm Economics. They use government data, peer-reviewed journals, and trade literature to support and enhance your business model at all stages. Whether an early stage pitch deck creation, return on investment modeling, or peer-reviewed article production, they can help. See how Charm Economics can transform your business development today so you can focus on building your product, growing your network, and implementing your vision. Check them out at charmeconomics.com. Dr. Christine Meyer, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. So tell us a little about your practice and where you are now, including your podcast. So I am older than you by a good bit. I hate to admit that, but it's true. I am in private practice, a practice I started in 2004, so you know, 19 years ago. It was just me and two examining rooms and, you know, on call every night. And now I have 20 clinicians and two buildings in this massive operation that I take care of, but I still see patients much like you. So I have this, you know, big enterprise and patients and my podcast is really a labor of love because I've learned a lot about talking to patients over the last 20 years. And I just want to pass that forward. That's what I've found. I found if you focus on the relationship with the patients, it turns them into evangelists and they're their own <laughs> marketing material. Like if you pay as much attention as you can to that, they do your marketing for you. You know, that's what you talk about in your podcast. What you're talking about our podcast is like, you know, kind of what are conversations that patients from their perspective, conversations that haven't gone well and how did they end up kind of turning things around? And that's one of the ways in which you've been successful is that connection with the patient is sacred, correct? Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. When people ask me, like, what's the secret to your success as a physician entrepreneur? I'm like, be a good doctor, period. And everything else follows. You know, like, it's not really tricky. You just have to be a really good doctor, which means being a really good listener. Is there anything else? I'm sorry. You started as a solo practitioner. And now how many clinicians are you? I'm embarrassed to say I said 20 and it's somewhere between 18 and 22. <laughs> the bigger the practice, the more that tends to fluctuate, right? Because, you know, yeah, someone exactly. leaves, someone new, right, right. That happens. Someone goes out on maternity. To what would you attribute the growth of your practice, the success of your practice? So like I said a second ago, you know, it started with me. Like I had to be insist on excellence from myself. And then, you know, the culture of excellent patient care just grew from that. And I just had to learn to be very uncompromising in the people I brought onto my team. So, which is painful because, you know, that's hard because sometimes they seem like they're going to be great and fit the culture and then they don't and it's chaos. But in the end, it's, you know, insisting on excellence from myself and then demanding it from everybody else. How do you pick that? Because that's, that's a question that I often wonder about. When you're hiring people, how do you know someone who's going to jive with your organization and your values? Because it might be someone who can like blow through tons of patients a day and bring in a lot of revenue, but sacrificing quality of care, right? So they might look good on paper for one reason, but really they don't jive with what you're aiming for in another way. So how do you interview for that? Well, today I would say I figured that out by getting it wrong way too many times. You know, in the beginning, I made so many disastrous hiring decisions. People who look fantastic on paper, like you said, churn through patients, you know, can code like nobody's business and generate loads of revenue and then are just terrible, either terrible for the team or terrible for the morale of the office. So I've just learned over time I've gotten good at asking the right questions and spending a lot of time with people. I don't hire people until they've spent, you know, many, many days wandering through my office with me. And I just watch them. I watch their interactions with my patients, with my staff, with me. You can learn a lot <laughs> by watching people within the environment for a few days. I heard that. I remember that from one of my prior interviews. I don't remember who it was that said it, but have them for lunch. 
like have them stay yeah. for lunch. And we weren't talking about clinicians because we undervalue ourselves because we're so few and far between. Physicians were so few yeah. and far between. So it's hard to really, you know, have one lunch, make sure that they jive with the team because it's going to be really hard to replace them. But for other staff members, when you're interviewing, have them stay for lunch because that's when they relax their guard and you can tell more of who they really are and if they're going to jive with the team, which is so important for culture and morale. So having them around for a few days, are you talking about everyone or just other clinicians? No, just other clinicians. Okay. You know, the support staff, we do have them do working interviews, usually for a shift. Yeah. And really, that just becomes about, like, how receptive are they to learning and criticism? Yeah. Those are the two things you can assess in one shift, right? And, you know, definitely we've made mistakes there, too, but their consequences aren't as high, right? Because yes. you can replace an MA, you can replace a receptionist, but if you get it wrong with a doctor or an advanced practitioner, it's a disaster. So those people I personally spend days with. So let's talk a bit more about the communication with the patients, right? Is there anything that you've learned from either practice or the podcast or both that you try to share with your partners and your employees? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the hardest lessons to learn and teach is to stop talking. Just stop talking and let the patient speak. We are so impatient. And, you know, I think it comes from a place of busyness, but it's also from a place of authority. I know you're the patient. Let me tell you. And I've learned over the years that a lot of times it's not so much that the patient is going to waste your time telling you things. It's that they need to tell you things. And, you know, 90% of your job is done if you just zip it and let them tell you. I think that is one of the key lessons that I really try to teach all of my clinicians. And when I talk to patients too, I hear these stories about like, oh shoot, I have definitely done that. I have definitely thought I was listening, but didn't listen quite long enough. I'm still learning. So it's the length of time that they can go uninterrupted. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard. You know, we have 20 minutes for a patient and you know, like some people, they could talk for 19 and a half <laughs> if you let them. You just have to... <laughs> Give them enough time without, you know, ruining your day in the process. I think just try and push it a little more than you normally would. I think that's exactly. a good way to think about it. Just your first impulse to interrupt, just kind of <laughs> tamp that down. Yeah, a little bit. I think that's a great lesson because we do have to balance listening with efficiency because we do have to respect the people in the waiting room. We have to respect the people that are trying to make appointments, but they can't because there isn't enough room in the schedule. How do you balance those two things? So for me, it's a little bit, I'm at an unfair advantage because I know my patients so well. They've been coming to see me for decades now. And I can say, you know, Mrs. So-and-so is going to definitely need 40 minutes at the end of my day, you know, or never schedule this patient, you know, as the first appointment. They always need to be the last appointment before lunch. And you just kind of like get a sense of who those people are. But I also think like there's a way to interrupt a patient and be kind about it not make them feel bad about talking a lot. Like I've heard doctors say things like, listen, we only have time for the top three things on your list today. What are those things? Like, I'm not sure, at least for a lot of my patients, that's the best way to do it. But, you know, saying things like, oh my gosh, you've got so much going on. I feel like I need to spend like three visits with you on this. Let's talk about some of the things today and bring you back and talk about the other things. I think it's really more about the delivery than the fact that you can never interrupt a patient. We don't have time for that. We don't have time. Yeah. And it sounds like leading with we're short on time is going to set the tone for the rest of the visit. And it also, you know, comes off as disrespectful, whereas like, oh, my goodness, I love that. You have so much important stuff that we need to talk about that we're really going to let's schedule. it. Let's get you scheduled. Let's get you more spots on my schedule instead of like, let's cram it all into right now so you can get out of here. Yeah. Exactly. Coming from a place of respect. I like that a lot because that's one of the things I lecture the, the medical students in my area. They're one of their end of the year on their way to residency lectures. And I talk about how to go through the office visit efficiently because that's and one of the things I say is sometimes you have to limit them to you choose two, I choose one or vice versa. But spinning it in a way like that, I think that's going to I'm going to have to add that to the lecture because I really like that. <laughs> yeah. Since you've been doing your podcast on these bad conversations that patients have had. Is there any of your conversations with patients that come to mind that you're like, oh, I've done that. Oh, like that you would have done 
differently? And if so, could you tell us about it? Absolutely. I will never say the words, it's just blank. Don't worry. At least it's not blank. And one of the key, this is actually perfect because you know exactly what I'm talking about. I told a patient that she just had thyroid cancer many years ago. Like, listen, and they, oh my God, I'm cringing even thinking about it. Like, if you have to get cancer, let it be thyroid cancer. What? So I talked to a patient on my podcast about that. And she was like, those were the worst words any doctor has ever said to me because it feels so minimizing and it is still cancer. And it's her first and hopefully only cancer. It's my 5,000th time telling somebody they have thyroid cancer. And I know in my heart that I meant it to be reassuring, but it came off totally not reassuring. So listen, I've been in practice so long and I literally just figured this out, you know, six months ago. That's a little <laughs> embarrassing, but very powerful lesson for sure. Yeah. Well, it seems like the message that you're trying to convey is, is you're going to do well. You're going to do well. I don't want you to think that this is a death sentence because that's probably what's going through your mind right now. The risk is very low. Ultimately, you end up minimizing their experience. So then how would you change that conversation now? What would be a better way to go about discussing it? Yeah, I would say something like there is no good way to spin this. You just found out you have cancer. But here are the positive things to take away. You know, your cancer is going to be curable. You know, very, very, very few people die of thyroid cancer. You know, this is going to be a moment in time, like things like that. But I think starting with, I get it. No kind of cancer is the kind of cancer any patient wants to get. So let's just say that, let's validate that. And then talk about all of the reasons to be really hopeful and the things that, you know, you should have peace with through all the fear, the fear that you're absolutely allowed to have. This is going to suck for the following reasons. You have every reason to not look forward to this. However, yeah, you leave on a positive. It's like a, you know, a criticism sandwich or whatever it is when you're telling one of your employees, listen, you got to show up late. You're doing this great. You're doing a really great job with this, but just show up on time or you're not working here anymore. Exactly. So I have some certainly bad conversations and don't even realize I'm having bad conversations. I only find out when I look at the Google review. I thought this patient loved me. And as it turns out, I was the worst. Often it's written in a run on sentence and, it, you know, it's like they're just venting and venting. And how do we know if we're having a bad conversation? I don't think you do, like you said, until the end sometimes, although your instincts get better as you get older and you're doing it more and more. I have had conversations with patients where I say, listen, this conversation has gone south and I value our relationship so much. I'm going to treat this like I treat my marriage. I think we both need to just take a step back and come back when we've cooled down. Like I've said that to many patients. And I mean, for me, I happen to value my marriage very, very much. And so if I would do it in my marriage, if I'm telling you, I think we need to do it in this relationship is because I value this relationship. And sometimes that really works. I think when patients hear me say, not so much like, this conversation needs to end because I'm done with you, but this conversation needs to end because nothing productive is going to come of it. They appreciate that. But I still had my share of people, you know, storming out and, you know, there's nothing you can do about that. You know, there's going to be those ones that you just can't save, but trying to not let it escalate to those terrible, you know, emotional door slamming kind of things is always better. I'm going to approach this the way I used to with my third wife. They might not like that spin. Right. It depends, right? It depends on the context of the marriage for sure. What about, you know, because a lot of times these conversations are with diagnoses that you're not sure what's going on, right? It's a challenge because it's a diagnostic dilemma. So you've got a patient with nebulous symptoms. You're taking them seriously, but you don't know what to do. You don't even know who to send them to. And I see stuff like this even though I'm a specialist, like there are super specialists. I can send them to a rhinologist or an otologist or a laryngologist. And I live in the shadow of Manhattan. So I, you know, I have tons of specialists at my disposal, but I'm still not sure where to go. And I am taking them seriously, but I'm just not sure what to do. How do we make sure that they don't feel dismissed? How do they make sure that they recognize that I care about them? I care about what they're going through. But I'm just not sure what to do. 
So for me, I always use the time thing. I always start with, wow, this is really complicated. I am going to need a little time to dig into this. I want to do some research. I want to talk to some colleagues. And then I take those visit notes and I do. I just spend time outside of the office visit, you know, digesting everything. Because I think, you know, when people's expectations are that they're going to come in, they're going to present their symptoms to you, and they're going to walk out with a diagnosis and a treatment plan in one visit. I think that's a setup for failure for patients that truly have those difficult symptoms. And you and I have both seen those patients who don't have anything wrong with them. They have miles of symptoms and nothing wrong with them. And if you are the doctor that says that after a 15-minute visit, that's a one-star Google review guaranteed. But if you're the doctor that comes to that conclusion, you know, five conversations in, in a very gentle way, like, look, here's what we've done. Here's, we've ruled out all of the sinister stuff. You still have these symptoms. I think we need to explore whatever, the anxiety, the toxic relationship, you know, whatever the thing is that you would never say in that first visit. So I think buying yourself time. Another trick I use is I am not ashamed to be very self-deprecating, you know, like, listen, I'm just an internist. I am old. (laughs) I am whatever the thing is. And just using that to say, like, I need a little more time and I need a little more help, but I'm saying these things to you because I really do want to help you. Those things tend to work for most of my trickiest diagnostic dilemmas. What about a little bit of a different spin? So being an otolaryngologist again, someone comes in with like a sore throat, a rip-roaring sore throat, which could very well just be the first day of a viral upper respiratory tract infection. You swab them for strep, they're strep negative, you look in their throat, and a lot of times in these patients, their exam is normal. So you look in their throat or I look in their throat. I'm like, it looks fine. First, the fact that the exam doesn't match the severity of the symptoms, I feel like already sets up a little bit of a contentiousness in the visit. And then the fact that they leave with Motrin, like they leave (laughs) basically empty handed other than being told like, listen, you're probably going to get worse because it's probably viral and, you know, stuffy nose, sore throat, cough, whatever is all going to I find they leave really unfulfilled. How do you manage those conversations? I tell myself that there are so many things that are sinister that present just like that, with the patient's symptoms out of connection with what they are showing on physical exam, like intestinal ischemia or pulmonary embolism, right? Like you look at some of those patients, you could swear up and down, there's not a blasted thing wrong with them. And then they're dead 24 hours later. You do not want to be that doctor. So I try to keep those, you know, very rare, but very, very memorable cases in the back of my mind. I love the WASP approach, the wait and see prescription. Okay. Not white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Okay. No, like you said, telling them you're probably going to get worse before you get better, but I don't want you to walk out of here feeling like I just pushed you off of a cliff. So Here's a prescription for, and it depends on the situation. It could be an antibiotic. And I could say, I don't think you need an antibiotic. Your strep test is negative. You definitely don't have bacterial sinusitis with 24 hours of symptoms. But this could be something that makes you feel better just knowing you have it. But if you get to that point where you feel like you're really going to need this antibiotic, let me know that. Give me a call. I think, and honestly, most of my patients never fill that prescription because they leave with very clear instructions. Like, you know, this is what needs to happen before we decide you need this antibiotic. And the other thing is I make sure they have access to us. You know, I just make sure that they're not walking out and then they're like, well, what do I do now? I got to sit on the phone for an hour trying to get a hold of her. We make sure there's very clear and open lines of communication for when they get worse or when things change, you know, 24, 48 hours later. Yeah, we have a patient portal, and that's yes. become really useful for those things. Like, send me a quick message. Hey, doc, I'm not better. I'm worse. And then it's like, click, click, click. Okay, great. I sent the prescription to your pharmacy. Because I think if it's in their medicine cabinet, they're more inclined to use it. Whereas if they have to take that step of, because some of them, you know, you tell them, listen, don't take it unless you have a week of symptoms or 10 days. And I think MIPS, MIPS some Medicare quality of care, you're actually not allowed to prescribe them antibiotics for sinusitis until they've had at least 10 days of symptoms or a second sickness where they're feeling better. It all has to be documented. So you want to tread lightly around that. But our portal has made it. I mean, not everyone has access to that type of infrastructure. And the other downside of that is, you know, sometimes we end up being a slave to the portal 
where like our oh, patients right. are constantly messaging about everything and it gives them, you know, tons of immediate access. It's a bit That's of just, right. Yeah. We haven't gotten there yet, but I could see that happening. So when you're taking on a new partner, actually, let's start with an older partner. Let's say they've decided to merge with your practice. They love what you're doing there. Is there any feedback that you would give to someone who's already kind of established their communication habits? Anything that you've maybe observed in your partners that have been in practice for a while that you'd like to just, if they were listening to this and they were going to take it into consideration, what would you like to nudge, you know, give them a little communication nudge? So maybe for a different podcast, but I don't have any partners. And that's kind of by design, but everybody that's in my practice, even people who've worked for me for decades or more are employed. And a lot of it is by their choice. But I think what you're getting at is those doctors and clinicians that have been in practice long enough to really be dug into their ways of doing things. Like what is the approach? One of the things I do at every clinician meeting, which we have once a month, is I talk about a clinical story. And it's usually one of my patients. And it's almost always something that I wish I'd done better. And I just start with that. You know, here's something that happened that I wish hadn't happened. And here's how I approached it. And here's a better way to approach it. Because nine times out of 10, that resonates with somebody sitting at that table. And hopefully they'll take from it a lesson for the next time. I cannot go to a doctor who's been in practice exactly as long as I have and said, you're doing this wrong. I mean, even if technically they are my employee, you know this, it just never goes over well in a relationship standpoint. And the lesson is almost often lost in the anger and the pride and, you know, all the things that come of it. So by example, I would say is the best way to teach those lessons. And what about someone, let's say you're lecturing to some residents who are about to finish their training, they're going to go into practice. You want to give them a clinical pearl about communication with their patients. Same thing. You know, listen first. I think the other thing about doctors and patients is like, I try to talk to my patients the way I talk to people I really care about. My really good friends, you know, my family, you know, the tone I would take with them, you know, be friendly, be respectful, really care about what they're saying. I think if you keep those things in mind, the conversation flows naturally. You know, if you're in a room and what you're thinking about is how fast can I get out of this room, that comes off in the conversation. Even if all the words coming out of your mouth are the right words, the tone is definitely there. So, you know, I would say approach your patient interactions the way you would approach the most important interactions to you in other aspects of your life. Again, as long as you like your spouse. If you (laughs) hate your spouse, maybe don't do that. But (laughs) that's really how I approach it. And I think that can be really helpful for people. And if you hate your spouse, I think two or three weeks from now, we're going to be having an episode on the Physician's Guide to Divorce. So make (laughs) sure you check out that episode. (laughs) Sad, but true. Yes. Okay. So where can people find your podcast? The podcast is called Tell Me More, Better Conversations in healthcare, and it's on every streaming service, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. You'll link to it in the show notes and my website. Well, I'm welcoming patients who want to tell their stories. I would love to hear from people who've had bad conversations that we can maybe make better. Okay, so it's learning from the patient perspective. So patients that have had bad conversations with one or multiple doctors and the patient's perspective and how they would like to see healthcare improve. Yes, exactly. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Christine Meyer, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening. I have a favor to ask. You listened to the episode until the end, which means you either fell asleep or you really liked the episode. So please share it or like it or comment on a social media post or write us a five-star review, something. It would really help me out. And maybe what you learned from this episode can help someone else too. The views expressed in this episode are those of the interviewer and interviewee and don't represent the views of their employer or even their significant other. Even though the magic of podcasting make it sound like I'm talking directly to you, this is not a doctor-patient relationship and this is not medical advice or financial advice or really any advice. Thank us again for listening to The Physician's Guide to Doctoring.